and we are alive again. So welcome everybody to one more talk from this series of the course, Molecular Methods Applied to, to Animal Ecology. Now with uh, the PhD student Guilherme Seda from Charles University. Uh, Guilherme is, was born in Madrid uh, in 1991. In 2009, he started his bachelor degree in biology at the Uni Autonomous University of Madrid. Uh, during those years, he gained deep interest on the fields of ecology, animal ecology, and nature conservation. To continue this path in 2015, uh, he moved to Utrecht, Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands, where he did his master's degree. Uh, during his time in the Netherlands, he had the opportunity to join, to get involved in several different projects. Uh, he also joined a team of Dutch scientists studying the migration of a bird species, the barnacle goose and joined an expedition in Arctic Russia. So he has a lot of field, ex field work experience across the world and across Europe as well. Uh, also, he joined the LIFE project for the conservation of the Iberian lynx, uh, which, where he studied the factor influence in the lynx link repro reproduction. Um, he also collaborated with the Royal Zoological Society uh, of Antwerp in Belgium, writing and reviewing the conservation status of lion tamarins here in Brazil. Uh, later in 2018, he started his PhD, which he is currently doing in the Department of Ecology uh, at the University of uh, Charles University in Prague. Uh, in his PhD, he's trying to disentangle the effects of altitude and seasonality on the interactions between Afrotropical flora and the birds that pollinate them. Uh, in his study in Mount Cameron, one of the rainiest places on Earth, he's going to tell you more about it, he's using modern metabolic techniques of pollen loads to reconstruct plant bird interactions networks along an elevation of gradient in between two seasons. Uh, so if you, Guilherme Uceda, Gomez Uceda, uh, talking about the Tales from Africa, use of metabolic coding to study plant bird interactions in the Afrotropics. Okay, hello uh, everybody. Thank you uh, to Hernani for giving me uh, the opportunity to participate in this course. I hope you will enjoy the talk. And um, I'm going to share with you what are uh, my methods that I, am been, I have been using for the past three years uh, in the course of my PhD. Well, Hernani perfectly presented me, so I think I will uh, skip uh, this part. But uh, maybe I can add just uh, some details. Uh, in Arctic Russia, I was uh, studying um, the energetics of migratory geese, uh, the barnacle goose, uh, and I was calculating their energy budgets. Also, uh, in Spain, I was uh, studying the reproduction of uh, the Iberian lynx and how uh, rabbit abundance, which is the main prey of the Iberian lynx, influences the, the, their reproduction. Now, I moved from temperate or arctic regions to, to the tropics, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, well, uh, this is an overview of, of my presentation. First, I will briefly describe what metabar coding is, is and what uh, steps it involves. And then I will uh, move on to how uh, we can use this technique to rebuild uh, plant-bird interactions. And finally, I will um, tell you about other uh, research lines that uh, our group has. So uh, what metabarcoding is? Um, well, uh, any metabarcoding or barcoding study has um, five basic steps. In my opinion, the first two are the most important. First, you should uh, choose an appropriate barcode that will be able to identify your target species. And also, really important, you should uh, have a good reference database in order to be able to detect those, those species contained in your samples. Afterwards, uh, you will have to extract the DNA and amplify it uh, with uh, specific primers that will uh, amplify only the desired region. And secondly, we'll, uh, we will sequence this DNA and finally, with a bioinformatic analysis, we will uh, analyze this data. Um, but what a barcode is, well, uh, in, in sort, is a variable region in the genome uh, that is uh, uh, flanked by two preserved uh, regions. And uh, these uh, preserved regions will serve 
as uh, for the binding sites uh, for our primer primers that we will use to amplify this region. But what other features uh, a barcode uh, should have? So it should also it should also be sorting length. It should be variable enough to uh, be able to detect individual species. Ideally, it should be outside of co uh, protein coding regions, and also ideally, it should be widely studied across all target taxa. Um, in the world of uh, plant molecular biology, um, we have these uh, candidates as treatable barcodes. Um, in the past, um, these uh, chloroplastic barcodes were more commonly used. However, now the focus has shifted to nuclear and more particular to ribosomal um, um, barcodes. Um, and what are the applications of metabarcoding? So uh, it, it has all sorts of applications ranging from ancient ecosystems to air quality monitoring, um, going through invasive species detections, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about today, plant pollinator interactions. Um, so uh, how do we use this technique uh, for detecting plant bird interactions? Uh, before the, moving on to the topic, I would like to introduce you some basic concepts uh, uh, of the world of pollination. And this will uh, help you to understand and frame uh, our studies. So first of all, uh, I would like to, uh, to note the importance of birds as pollinators. In the world, uh, birds uh, pollinate more than 500 genera out of uh, 1,300 uh, genera of plant species. And we have uh, four main families that uh, pollinate plants across the world. Uh, our study species uh, belong to the Nectarinidae family. These are the sunbirds. And they are an old world taxa uh, that, you can be, uh, that can be found in Africa and in Southeast Asia. Uh, also wide, uh, widely known, uh, you have Trochilidae, the, the hummingbirds that are only found in um, the Americas. And then you have other families like Mel Melifagidae and Tisiculidae in Australia. Um, in the world of pollination, all the studies have been um, framed under the concept of pollination syndrome hypothesis. Uh, this concept was already uh, proposed by Darwin back in the 1800s, and it has been developed through the course of history by uh, several researchers. Uh, the concept as we understand it today uh, was developed by Van der Pyl in, uh, in the 70s, and these concepts um, <clears throat> um, means that uh, certain suits of traits of the pollinators are adapted to uh, certain suits of traits of, of the flowers they visit. Uh, if we narrow down this concept to just bird pollination, and, we, and therefore we will call it bird pollination syndrome, uh, this uh, will imply that all the flowers visited by birds will have typically red or orange colors, like the ones you can see in the figure. They will have uh, long, uh, long um, corolla tubes. They are normally without extent, and they produce a relatively high uh, amount of nectar, but of low sugar concentration, as opposed of those flowers that are visited by um, insects, like these ones that normally have um, a white color or yellow color, they produce a small amounts of nectar, but of, uh, of, of, of really high sugar content. When it comes to uh, the adaptations that birds have uh, developed uh, to pollinate these plants, uh, one of the most important things uh, is the bill length and bean shape. In this sense, um, um, bill length will play a, a great role because as you can imagine, if you have a really short bill, you wouldn't be able to drink from uh, flowers that have a, a really long corolla tube, therefore not being able to uh, reach the nectaries where the nectar is produced. Uh, other adaptations that these birds uh, have 
um, are uh, related to uh, the tongue. Um, normally, the tongues of the nectariburus birds uh, are tubular and they are uh, f their ending is like a brass and, and the nectar goes up the tongue by capillarity. Uh, other adaptations are also related to how uh, the bird drinks uh, from the flower. For example, hummingbirds uh, nor, uh, drink uh, while hovering, so they have adaptations in their wings and the scapular bones that enable the, them to uh, do these, uh, these behaviors. Uh, although this concept has been widely used to uh, predict uh, plant bird interactions or uh, pollinator plant interactions more in general, now it's still uh, it's in debate and we should take it uh, carefully. Um, so uh, after this, uh, I would I'd like to show you some examples uh, from our study site uh, that are this. Uh, on the left-hand side, we can see Theanometra oritis, or Mount Cameroon sunbird, drinking from uh, Impatient Saccharyana. On the right-hand side, uh, we have uh, Theanometra olivacea, drinking from Fragmentera cameroonensis. As you can see, there is a perfect match between the flowers and the birds, and if you have a closer look to the, uh, to the pictures, you could see that the stigmas of the flowers are placed in, the, in that way that the pollen will be placed on the bird's head or the bill. So now taking into account uh, these uh, concepts, I would like to talk about uh, the differences between sunbirds and hummingbirds. Uh, well, um, for a long time, it was uh, said that uh, sunbirds were not able to perch, although uh, today we, we know that uh, they present this behavior, as it is seen in this picture, taken by uh, my colleagues in uh, Mon Cameroon. And uh, they, it was said that, um, that uh, they, they, their behavior when drinking the nectar was more like uh, perching from the flower, like in this case. Also, the interactions that they have with the flowers they visit are less specialized than, than those ones that the, the hummingbirds have. Um, moreover, um, in the world there are uh, uh, about 130 species of sunbirds, whereas uh, hummingbirds account for uh, a bit more than 300 species. Uh, they live in the in the old world in in Africa and in Asia, whereas hummingbirds uh, live in the new world. Uh, normally, sunbirds are all, uh, bigger in size, probably related to, to uh, their behavior that they tend more to perch rather than to hover. And another important difference is that they are not strict nectarivores. Uh, the, uh, sometimes uh, complementing their diets with uh, insects. So um, after this, um, I would like to introduce you some uh, drivers of plant bird interactions that can affect how these interactions uh, are, um, are found. Uh, in the first place, we have the diversity of interacting partners the local abundance of these, of these uh, in, uh, uh, interacting partners, the phylogenetic relationships, uh, uh, because this is in relation to uh, the bird uh, pollination syndrome concept that in, implies a tight coevolution between the two interacting parties, and uh, therefore they have a common uh, uh, evolutionary history. Also, morphological traits uh, related to trade matching between the flowers and, and the birds, and uh, less studied but also uh, equally important altitude and seasonality. Uh, altitude and seasonality is the main focus of our studies, and I will uh, um, talk a bit more uh, about them uh, later. So, why, why are we uh, conducting our studies in the Afrotropics? Well, first of all, uh, the Afrotropics represent uh, um, a biodiversity hotspot that is highly understudied by science. Uh, also, when it comes to pollination or uh, studies, uh, if we focus on this map, we see that uh, across the Americas there are many studies, both uh, 
with comprehensive and partial networks. Also in Europe is the same case. But if we focused on, on Africa, there is just a handful of uh, these studies. Also in our area, which is uh, here in Cameroon, in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, there is only one study which was conducted by my team, but also these are, are uh, partial networks. So there is the need of um, understanding uh, how these communities work and how they interact among each other. Um, so uh, taking in, in, in mind these concepts and uh, the fact that the uh, uh, Afrotropics are highly understudied, uh, we uh, posed uh, the following research questions and a hypothesis. Uh, in the first place, we want to answer if altitude and seasonality have an, any effect on plant brain pollination interaction features. This is, implies how generalized or specialized the interactions among birds and plants uh, are, and, this, uh, and if this generalization or specialization is affected by altitude and seasonality. In this sense, uh, our, our hypothesis uh, were the following ones. Um, first of all, we expect higher generalization and specialization of birds and plants respectively at higher altitudes. Uh, we expect higher specialization of birds and plants during the rainy season, and we expect higher modularity during the rainy season, meaning that you would find certain sets of species interacting among each other and not with other sets of these species. Secondly, uh, we want to know if uh, altitude and seasonality have uh, any effect on plant bird pollination communities. And in this sense, uh, we also have three hypotheses. In, <clears throat> in the first place, um, we expect that there will be a higher proportion of bird pollinated plants at higher altitudes and during the rainy season. This is in relation to harsher conditions where insect pollinators are not able to thrive. thrive. Uh, then uh, we expect that trade matching, uh, matching will uh, decrease with uh, altitude, but it will uh, be more important during the rainy season. This is in relation also to the phenology of the plant species that we found uh, there in Cameroon, because for example, uh, dry season, is the flowering season for trees, whereas the rainy season is the flowering season for the herbs, which tend to be more specialized for bird pollination. So uh, the, how, how are we trying to answer these questions? Well, we have um, different methods uh, that we combine uh, traditional and more modern molecular methods. Uh, when it comes to the more traditional ones, uh, we, we use these um, security cameras to record uh, plant bird interactions. Um, in this sense, uh, we have established uh, transects along uh, the altitudes in which we, we conduct our study. And uh, we film every flowering plant and we aim to film uh, between 10 to 15 individuals uh, during 24 hours. Also, for those uh, plants that are too big to be framed in the camera, what we do is uh, personal direct observation. Normally, this implies uh, climbing to a neighboring tree and uh, sitting there for eight hours um, observing the bird visitors with binoculars. Uh, to complement these uh, traditional techniques, uh, we use modern metabarcoding of pollen loads. Uh, and also we have, we record some uh, variables that might be explaining these interactions. In this sense, uh, we record um, morphological measures of the flowers, like the length of the, of the corolla, uh, the amount of, of uh, nectar they produce, or how this uh, nectar is uh, concentrated in sugar. Uh, however, um, I, Today, I, I will talk just uh, about metabarcoding. So, uh, let me present to you our study area. Our study area is uh, Mount Cameroon. Uh, Mount Cameroon is in the, in, in the Gulf of Guinea, in front of the island of Bayoko. Bayoko. 
It's a volcanic uh, mountain belonging to a volcanic mountain range that stretches from the island of Ioku up north in, in, uh, in Cameroon. Um, it presents marked seasonality, uh, which is uh, a bit uh, strange for a tropical area, uh, and therefore it has periods of heavy rains and also periods of water shortage. If we have a closer look to this graph, uh, we can see that, uh, for example, in the, in the month of July, in the altitude of 650 uh, meters, uh, there is a, a rain of almost 3,000 millimeters. And, mm, and uh, then if we focused on the, the dry period, let's say in June, it can be actually zero. It also it's a, a, a complete forest gradient, meaning that you have natural forest from sea level up to the timber line, and that's why it's a good um, place to study the influence of altitude and seasonality. Uh, also, the mountain uh, is a natural uh, na nature reserve uh, which has 56 hectares. There are high rates of uh, endemism and that there is the presence of big mammals. In this sense, we have Loxodonta chiclotis, which is the forest elephant, which uh, I would say is an uh, engineering species in the area because at, uh, it's quite prevalent at the mid elevations and it destroys, um, it destroys the forest. So if you go there, you want to find a typical uh, rainforest with closed canopy because the elephants create many open spaces and therefore this can also uh, have an influence on on the, the, the plant parity interactions that we are studying. Also you have uh, uh, chimpanzees and when it comes to bird diversity, uh, Colleagues have found that there are more than 200 bird species. Its diversity peaks uh, are, are around 650 meters above sea level. And there are some iconic species like the Mount, Mount Cameroon Spirops, um, the Mount Cameroon Francolin, or the endangered uh, red-necked um, Picatartes. So, <clears throat> Uh, um, we have gone to the mountain in four uh, occasions. Um, uh, we have been there both in dry and rainy season, and uh, each time we have been sampling to two locations, so, so two altitudes. Uh, every time what we have been doing has been uh, bird catching with regular mist netting or with uh, ground to canopy mist nets. Then we were ringing and measuring these birds. As I said, we observe bird visitors and record with the cameras. And also we have been uh, collecting pollen samples from the sunbirds. The, uh, the way in which we collect these samples is that before removing the bird from the, from the net, as you can see in this picture, uh, we use a cotton swab uh, that we pass through the bill and head of the, of the bird, then they inc we include this cotton swab into a, a city sit up solution to preserve uh, the, the sample, and then we release the bird from from the net. Uh, other other things that we do are, were pheno phenological surveys of the plants flowering, and also uh, we were collecting leaf samples uh, in order to build a reference database for. Uh, our metabar coding study. So, uh, paying attention to the amount of samples that we have collected, if we, if we just focus on the pollen samples, um, we have collected more than 1,200 uh, pollen samples um, uh, in all the elevations. The most biodiverse um, uh, um, a locality was drinking Gary, from which we have eight and seven uh, sunbird species, whereas in Mansfield, which is the highest, uh, we only have five species. Together with blood samples, we were also collecting uh, blood samples uh, from one of these sunbird species, uh, uh, in particular Cyanometra oritis. 
because we were not able to uh, sex it uh, in the field, so we will sex it uh, molecularly uh, to add an extra layer of uh, information uh, to, to our study of the interactions. So uh, these five species are the most represented uh, species in our data set. Uh, this one is the northern double color sunbird, which lives in the upper elevations. Uh, and also it goes far beyond the forest, going into the grasslands, almost to the submit. Then this is the Ursula sunbird, uh, living in middle elevations. Um, this is uh, the olive sunbird, which is typical to be found in the lower elevations. And this is the Theanomitra oritis, uh, which is uh, found uh, from the middle elevations up to the, the higher ones, although uh, it's more common in the middle elevations. And this is not a sunbird, but um, we use this bird, which is a green long tail, as a control bird because it's strictly um, nectarivorous. So, uh, what's the idea behind the, the metabarcoding of pollen loads? So, let's uh, imagine that we have an observed visitation event. Uh, so, therefore, we will catch uh, all the animals that could have potentially done uh, that, uh, that uh, visit. We will sample the pollen, as it is seen uh, in this picture. Then we will sequence this pollen, and then we will compare these sequences against um, available databases. Or, as in our case, you can compare it with, our, uh, with your own uh, local reference database. In our case, we have collected uh, leaf samples to build this uh, database for more than uh, 70 plant species, uh, which belong to 16 botanical uh, families. And then we have, uh, we have sequenced this, the, our targeted regions by Sanger sequencing. Uh, to, um, to, uh, to talk about uh, what markers we are using, well, um, as I said before, uh, the, the most common ones uh, these days are uh, the ribosomal ones. So therefore, we are uh, using uh, these two, ITS2 and ITS1, which belong to the internal transcribed spacer. If we focus on the genome of the plant, ITS2, ITS1, sorry, uh, falls in between the 18S and 5.S region, and ITS2 falls between 5.S and 26X. To, uh, to amplify this region, so we are using um, some universal primers proposed by some uh, other researchers, and these are uh, U3 and U3, U4 for ITS2 and U1, U2 for ITS1. So, uh, but why, why we chose uh, these, these um, markers? Well, particularly ITS2 has been found to be quite efficient in species uh, recognition. This is a study from Chen et al. in 2010. And if we, fa uh, we um, focused on the table, uh, we see that the correct identification of the plant species in their samples went up to 93% using the blast, uh, BLAST method, whereas it was slightly uh, lower with distant method. If we compare these figures to other markers like PSBA, TR, and H, we see that these values are way lower. And also another study, um, if we focused on the on the on the red and the orange bars, uh, these are uh, plant species belonging to angiosperms. So if we uh, we see that for most of them the values go from uh, from 80 or uh, uh, higher. So that's why we are using ITS2. And uh, in order to increase uh, our uh, the the detectability. We are combining two markers because the information we are getting uh, with one will be complemented with the other one. So like this, we will increase the chances of correctly identifying our species uh, in our samples. So um, 
And just to briefly talk about how we built a reference uh, database, well, this is common procedure. Uh, we sampled all flowering plants. We uh, took leaf samples from several individuals. Then uh, we isolated uh, uh, our target regions, our, uh, sorry, the, the DNA by uh, uh, commercial kits. Then we amplified our uh, target regions. We sequenced it by Sanger. Then with a software called Genius, we produce consensus sequences and then we blast them uh, uh, against GeneBank. Uh, this is uh, how uh, a typical uh, sequence, uh, sequence uh, from, from Sanger sequencing looks like. Sometimes at the beginning, uh, um, the the quality of re the, of the reads, uh, which is depicted by the height of the of the columns, uh, is not that good. So what you do is to trim that part. Also, it's common to find a low quality at the at the end of the um, of the um, uh, sequence. So you trim those two things, and then uh, in the case of the reverse sequence, uh, what you do is uh, like you you produce a reverse complement and then you align these these two uh, sequences to produce a consensus consensus sequence and finally you can uh, blast it and know if you did it correctly this is how it looks like and in particular this sequence belongs to uh, this plant brillantasia ovariensis which is common in the upper elevations of mount cameroon uh, if we, if I go further in detail about the um, the metabar coding, well, our protocol is based on a two-step uh, PCR into uh, two PCRs. In the first step, we will amplify our target regions, and in the second step, uh, we are uh, indexing uh, the, the the libraries produced. Um, also, what we are doing is that uh, to be able to uh, identify our samples uh, by altitude and, and season, we are using different sets, sets of primers for each of these uh, regions. So um, if we focused on this diagram uh, and we see month spring dry season, we will amplify each sample from that, uh, from that uh, altitude and season three times to avoid four uh, PCR biases and to increase the chances of getting those pollen uh, grains that are in low concentration. And we will amplify them with uh, three different uh, forward primers, but the uh, reverse primer is always the same. And then we will continue with other uh, uh, seasons or altitudes you see different forward primers as you see here four five six seven eight nine uh, and the same will be uh, replicated for uh, uh, the other market marker so once you have all the triplicates from both markers what you have to do is to combine these triplicates into one single sample and then you can produce the so-called uh, partial libraries after this, uh, you have to uh, purify these, uh, these samples uh, with this method, which is based on magnetic bits. Uh, I find it actually quite cool because, um, well, uh, you can choose the fragment size uh, to, to be purified depending on the ratio of DNA to uh, buffer that you, that you add into, into the solution. So uh, as is uh, depicted in the, in the diagram, you mix your sample with uh, this uh, chemical. This chemical has a small magnetic bits that are coated with something that um, has affinity to, to DNA, so it will bind the DNA. Then you place uh, the, the tube into a magnetic rack. Uh, the, the DNA will go to the back of the, of the, of the tube or if you have another type of rack, it will be at the bottom, but around the, the tube. And in this way, you can easily extract with the pipe the supernatant, then wash it with ethanol two times, and then 
include an illusion buffer, which can be either water or uh, or TVA. So uh, this is how uh, the 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 construction of the libraries looks like. Here I have my list of how to combine the the samples, and these are each of these um, these uh, triplicates. So uh, in the end. Uh, I will take samples from each of these and combine it uh, in a way that I chose previously. Uh, when combining the, the samples, uh, you should uh, do it at equal volumes, but also you, you should not put um, many samples uh, uh, together. Let's say uh, you cannot put eight samples together, but, uh, but uh, it should be um, equally distributed. Uh, in the second step, uh, in the second PCR, what we do is uh, we are going to index uh, our samples. For this purpose, we have um, 18, uh, 18 uh, forward uh, tags, sorry, 16, and uh, 24 reverse tags. Uh, there are uh, two common uh, ways of doing this, uh, the non-redundant indexing or combinatorial indexing. In non-redundant indexing, uh, uh, each well has um, one forward uh, tag and one reverse tag for that particular well. Whereas in combinatorial indexing, the indexes are repeated across uh, rows and columns. Um, this uh, is, of course, uh, cheaper because you need less, uh, less tags. And in our case, we can produce up to 384 unique tag combinations. Uh, in the end, uh, this is how, how this uh, indexing looks like. Uh, we, we chose to do it as uh, combinatorial indexing. So this tag will be the same across the row and this tag across the column. Uh, the orange uh, uh, spots are um, blank combinations because there is this phenomenon that occurs during the sequencing that is called tag jumping, that the, the tags can jump from well to, uh, from sample to sample, and therefore you will wrongly identify your libraries. However, if you leave uh, some combination of tags blank, you at least know you could know that uh, there has been uh, tag jumping. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, one should uh, always, when doing metabarcoding, should have extraction controls and, and uh, PCR controls. In our case, what we did was, uh, when uh, starting the uh, destruction of our pollen samples, we were passing a cotton swab through the surfaces to control for uh, potential contamination coming from the working surfaces. Uh, also, uh, during the PCR, we added to each PCR three PCR controls so that had water instead of DNA template. And also, uh, we were using, we were working at any time under uh, Flowbox uh, because this method, and especially with uh, pollen, are highly sensitive uh, to contamination. And also we were using an air purifier to avoid pollen from the environment coming into our samples. In the end, uh, after all this process, uh, uh, I, um, I have produced about 400 uh, libraries that are contained in two tubes. Uh, so, for you to imagine how powerful this technique is, in these two tubes uh, you have all the all the 1,200 uh, samples collected in the field, plus all the extraction controls, plus all the PCR controls. So, in one single uh, run, you can run as many samples as you want. So. This would be everything uh, for the metabar coding, uh, but I would like to present uh, you uh, other research lines uh, that uh, we we are uh, doing. In this sense, um, this is a study that um, um, 
that uh, it was already published in the Ecology and Evolution. Um, I got the opportunity to get involved in this study at the beginning of my PhD, and um, I contributed to the laboratory part of the, of the study. I was uh, in this study. We were testing if our local sunbirds were able to pollinate alien uh, plant species. These uh, plant plants were in a plantation uh, that, that uh, are growing heliconias from South America or uh, lingeras uh, from Asia uh, for commercial purposes. So. <clears throat> Um, well, uh, to put it short, the outcome of the, um, of the study was that uh, our local sunbirds were able to successfully pollinate uh, at Lingeras, as it is shown by the development of uh, pollen tubes. Uh, here you can see that uh, in the control treatment where uh, the birds were allowed to uh, visit the plants, uh, the germination of pollen tubes was way higher than in the uh, control treatment uh, where uh, the birds were excluded by buying the flowers. Uh, also, um, this was tested with other kinds of methods, like um, the numbers, uh, the, the numbers of, um, of visits that um, touch the reproductive parts, because these are the only legit visits. And here, if you see uh, Theanometra oritis, uh, which is in black, was, um, was um, quite frequently visiting uh, or touching the reproductive parts of the, of the flower. Uh, and also to, to control for other uh, things that can be uh, driving these interactions, um, uh, the next, uh, we, we took samples of, um, of uh, volumes of nectar uh, across all these plants, uh, but uh, this didn't explain the visitation frequencies. As you can see, the volumes are rather different and, uh, sorry, similar, and also uh, the sugar concentration as well. So the next uh, study that I would like to present to you is this about the spatial temporal uh, pattern of the specialization of sunflower networks. Uh, we well, we have submitted this uh, this paper to several journals. It's now currently uh, in review or uh, in preparation. So <clears throat> what we found uh, in this study that uh, well. First of all, uh, it was in dry season and in the lower elevation, so in this part of the graph, where we found the most uh, uh, sunbird species, whereas most of the highest number of plants was found in the middle elevations uh, here. Uh, also, we, f we found that the specialization decreases with altitude, uh, that there was more specialization during the rainy season, um, probably because, uh, as I said before, uh, the rainy season is the flowering time for herbs, which tend to be more specialized for uh, bird pollination rather than trees which flower in uh, the dry season. Also, connectance, which is a measure of, of, the, um, of the number of realized interactions uh, of all possible interactions that are in the network, increase with elevation. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce you this other study that was uh, accepted in OICOS um, this uh, week. In this study, we, we were testing the, the, the concept of bird pollination syndrome. Uh, and for this purpose, uh, uh, we compiled two different data sets. One about um, bird visitation and another one about uh, uh, insect visitation. And uh, <clears throat> then we wanted to know if insects preferred the different groups of, of plants as compared to birds. This would be the first scenario. That then we wanted to test if plants building bird pollination syndrome were more preferred by birds than, than by insects. And if the third scenario, if 
uh, birds prefer plants with bear pollination syndrome? Well, so uh, the, the outcome of this study was that um, from the birds' point of view, they seem not to care uh, which plants, uh, which plant uh, they visit, as long as it has a good nectar reward. Although, on the other hand, uh, uh, flowers uh, with bird pollination syndrome were more visited by birds. So, for example, uh, if uh, from the pollinator point of view, so the birds' point of view. If we focus here, this is an ordination uh, diagram uh, that compiles se seven different variables. Um, we, we, if we focus on this dot, uh, this is Nuxia congesta. Nuxia congesta is a tree that is typically uh, pollinated by, by, by bees, but it produces uh, huge amounts of nectar, so uh, birds visit it a lot. On the other hand, we have these, which are the, uh, the, the plants we, which typically have the bird pollination syndrome, but we can see that uh, they are less visited, less visited by birds. Uh, then, uh, to finalize my presentation, I, I wanted to introduce you what is going to be our future research lines, which also involve metabar coding, and uh, that we, uh, we obtained some funding recently to conduct these uh, studies. Well, um, first of all, I would uh, like to put you uh, in place. So imagine that um, in Mount Cameroon, we have this forest uh, gradient that I was talking about before. Uh, and then it goes up to the timber line. And then from the timber line, the uh, habitat sharply changes into, uh, into um, grasslands. So we move from a mountain forest, uh, like in this picture, to, um, to um, grasslands. But there is a buffer zone, uh, an ecotome of mixed vegetation in which you have a species coming from uh, both, uh, both uh, uh, biotopes. So um, in this scenario, we want to uh, study uh, the niche partitioning of this bird species. Um, I already presented you this bird. Uh, this bird is typical from the higher the elevations. It goes, let's say, from around 1,800 up to, up to uh, almost uh, the submit. It's highly dimorphic. Uh, on, the, on the left, you have the, the, the male. On the, on the right, the female. So the one could expect that uh, there, there could be intraspecific and intersexual niche partitioning. And um, to test this, we want to use, again, metabar coding of pollen loads. And uh, moreover, we want to, to, to see if this niche partitioning will have an influence on, uh, on the morphology of the birds, because if they are adapted to different uh, plant resources, one could expect that uh, the bill safe will change accordingly. So that's all from me. Um, I would like to thank uh, my research team, uh, led by my supervisor, Stepan Janicek, who, who has been super supportive uh, along, the, 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 along my PhD. Also, all, all the people that I collaborated with, and also the field assistants, uh, without which uh, any of these would have been impossible. And um, I would like to thank you, the Czech Science Foundation and the Great Agency of Charter University for funding our research. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.